Today we are going to focus on Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf uh, was born in 1882 and uh, she had uh, she was from a very affluent household. She was the um, seventh child of a blended family of eight. So that means, you know, she, there were eight members, siblings, she had about eight siblings, but um, some of them were her half brothers. Uh, so like her mother's, uh, the, the children from her mother's previous marriage. So she was a seventh child and her mom died when she was very young. So she, that is the time when she had a mental breakdown and uh, th there were many other breakdowns and uh, mental breakdowns uh, that she had been having over the years and it also resulted in a, many times she was even institutionalized. So her uh, death of her half-sister who was like a mother to her, that also affected Virginia. Moreover, she was uh, also abused uh, during her childhood by her half-brothers. I mean, it's a very controversial thing because some of them say it didn't happen, but uh, some of the books the, that she had written, she had mentioned about it. So there's a controversy regarding that. But uh, effectively, as a result of all this abuse that she had to undergo, she had all these, uh, you know, state of intense depression and... Uh, so that's how, she, that, that's the kind of person she was. So when we read her books, when we read her novels, all these uh, things, you know, these psychological aspects are brought out inside in some of the characters. So her adulthood was spent among friends of the Bloomsbury group that included Keynes, Strachey and E.M. Forster. And uh, the Bloomsbury group, this was a group which was um, mainly, they, they, they were creating a very nurturing, creative environment. Uh, you know, what they did was they used to focus and support uh, the small artists, you know, give them a platform to showcase themselves. And um, its role, that is this Bloomsbury group's role was central to the development of art during the early 20th century. So, um, Virginia Woolf helped shape modernism in England both as a critic and as a novelist. And her best known novels are Mrs. Dalloway, To the Lighthouse and the Waves. She um, represents a historical mo moment when art was integrated into society during this period. So, you know, at, at the era when where, where, um, uh, Wolf was writing this, this time period, she was, the, during that time, the women were expected to be very submissive to their husbands. Uh, they were more mainly, you know, supposed to be at home in the kitchen or looking after the children. They were guardians and primary educators of their children. This was their, supposed to be their priority. And uh, she broke the stereotype of what a woman should be and should do. So as a critic, her major contribution to literature is uh, typically thought to be her feminist critique of society. This is her major contribution to literature. She used, uh, while writing, she was one of the pioneers of using the stream of consciousness technique, which is the hallmark of modernism. So uh, what is a stream of consciousness? Uh, stream of consciousness is a literary style where a character's thoughts, feelings and reactions are depicted in a continuous flow of uninterrupted of in a continuous flow uninterrupted by the description of conventional dialogue. See like you know whenever you read something, the character's thoughts that is whatever is there in your head, feelings that is of the heart reactions means the way they um, act their actions so you can think of heart head and hand you know if you to understand that so all these things these three things were depicted as a flow so when you read something you 
about a character you will know what is a character's thought what are the character's feelings and what the character is doing so then you have a complete a, a complete dimensional view all the perspectives come to you when you are looking at a character when you are reading about a character it's not just a one sided uh, interpretation of the character so james joyce and virginia woolf Uh, are among the uh, notable exponents of this uh, stream of consciousness and i think if you are not mistaken in poetry also we did uh, eliot he also used this uh, stream of consciousness uh, technique when uh, at least we find it at least i feel it was when he, uh, he was writing the wasteland so it's a narrative technique and it's non dramatic fiction and that renders a flow of uh, various in- impressions and it impinges on your consciousness and you become aware of the character of the individual a complete awareness of the individual is there in your head so the reader is able to track the mental state of the character so internal psychological monologue of the pro- protagonist is shown in this stream of consciousness technique uh and besides this uh, uh she started this uh, hogarth pr- printing uh, the press you know she ventured into publishing you know she did this printing as a hobby it was like a diversion for her and they kept it on the dining table at hogarth house so that's how this name came about the hogarth press and um, she used to print uh, all kinds of experimental short stories and and it also it so happens that she also Uh, got uh, Freud's papers. Some of Freud's papers were printed by this press. Okay, enough of uh, the background of Virginia Woolf. Now let's see uh, the age in which she lived. The kind of um, the the age, political, social, and cultural scenes during Woolf's time. British Empire was on the decline. A uh, public uh, confidence had declined. uh britain was following an isolationist policy uh and within britain there was rural dislocation urban unemployment and rise of trade unionism so there was a, a conflict initially uh between great britain and france and there were a lot of wars were fought in the past in europe and as a result of which you know the uh, uh the british empire you know it was on shaky ground and the issues worsened during the seven years war when french and britain uh, france and britain uh, fought over land and trading control and uh, britain was following the isolationist policy uh, so this policy is actually you know when uh, a, a nation a country uh, keeps to itself and doesn't interfere in the affairs of any other country so they uh, decline to enter into any alliances and you know they keep to themselves so they want so so that they're able to maintain peace within their land so that is the isolationist policy so britain followed this isolate isolationist policy and within britain you know there this industrial revolution had taken place so there was a lot of uh, uh, migration of people from the rural areas to the urban areas and new urban areas were were uh, coming up and uh, there was urban unemployment also and along with the rise of trade unionism you know the working class they were unhappy with uh, the capitalistic uh, the culture of these uh, of the bourgeoisie and the the owners the owning class so what they did was they formed unions and uh, they were started protesting so a lot of uh, things were happening during this period and culturally there was an increase in literacy and rise in the number of novels so number of the people who started reading that there was an increase in that and they were also culturally diverse in the sense that more women also started reading started reading books and novels so uh, compared to uh, bolsonkoff's uh, time uh, the number of uh, uh, people the population where literacy is concerned there was definitely an increase so what was the status of uh, women during that time during uh, wolf's time 
women had campaigned for the right to vote there were more career options had opened up see career options like um, teaching nursing typing all these things you know it was there so new kinds of women writers entered the field women novelists came into their own and um, no uh, novels were popular no one you know for writing a novel one needn't uh, be, have a classical education to read and write so novels were very popular and if you look at it uh, wolf had austen bronch sisters and george eliot as reference whereas uh, wollstonecraft didn't have anyone as a reference she had only clarissa to refer to you know and that time during western craft's time a uh, novel was in its infancy and it reached a uh, you know a sort of a, not a peak it re- reached a higher stage during wolf's time so these were the uh, uh, popular women writers jane austen george eliot and as a result you know it was easy for uh, wolf to collect data to con- when she was constructing her thesis you know this feminist theory she was she was writing on this she found it uh, easy to get information you know she, she could look back into something to the ancestors and try and get some information on it public schools also came up for girls and colleges came, uh, you know sprouted in london cambridge and oxford so overall there was a slight um, what you call it uh improvement uh, where women were concerned like at least they were being able to go to school and they were able to get an education so now we come to um this room of one's own this particular essay that uh, uh that uh, wolf had written uh, she had addressed an audience you know she was asked she was invited to uh, speak about uh, you know give a talk to the girls of uh, two colleges in cambridge and uh, all these the talks that she held they were compiled and they were published as a room of one's own so these women's colleges were uh, underfunded when compared to the men's colleges so so that itself tells you how much uh, importance was being given to education where women are concerned and wolf builds on these details and she tries to bring up an argument that to write a woman needs financial independence and a room of her own so basically this essay is all focusing on um, uh, that a woman should be financially uh, independent only then she will be able to make it out you know in society she will be able to rise above in society without financial independence she will be nowhere she, she if she has to break the shackles of patriarchy she has to become financially independent so women have traditionally been at a disadvantage in matters of economic independence and privacy so though she addressed a university audience she was acutely conscious of the fact that she did not have a university education so here you will notice that virginia wolf did not have a university education she uh, though her brothers were all you know they could go to colleges and they could have an education she was a very intelligent lady but unfortunately due to the society you know they don't allow they, they felt that girls are not meant to go out and uh, you know have a Uh, education outside so she acquired whatever she could whatever she could uh, understand about what is being taught uh, outside all that she acquired it from her father's library so she was deprived of an education by the patriarchy so looking at the um a relationship between her as a theorist and an audience so you know when she when um, uh, when wolf is uh, giving this uh, talk we uh, we have a look at like you know she is a theorist and who is her audience we have to look at both the points of view we will say that both of them were women and they were sharing the 
uh, space and concerns they both had similar concerns they came from the same ethnic group and obviously these students of these colleges they had to be up slight at least a bit well off upper middle class at least because they to afford a an university education so you will know that they were also of a certain standard but there was a skew in this relationship between the theorist that is uh, wolf and the audience these are the uh, young uh, students that is the students were getting a university education whereas she was deprived of it so but once the essay was published when the essay was published when this room of one soul was published the reading public was different now because uh, who are going to read uh, her essays it's going to be the men and obviously the men are going to be ready to attack you know hammer and tongs to attack uh, whatever she has written so the reviewers were men and the women and men readers were professionals so what's happened is in the, uh, the 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 professionals will be there there were women also now no who was uh, getting you know who were in the fields having jobs and everything so they were they didn't have any issues about you know being deprived of this so whatever uh, wolf had written in in this essay that wasn't uh, you know holding good for these professionals even though they were women so the reading public was different uh, so what does uh, this essay contain so here she reiterates mm. that economic in independence and domestic space are prerequisites for women to write so she is actually you know encouraging women to start writing but she says that you need a money and you need a room of your own if you have to write fiction if you need to write you have to have money and you have to have a room you know some space of your own and here we are going to focus uh, in this study we will be focusing only on chapter 4 we are stressing on chapter 4 and in this chapter she says it's difficult for women to produce the same quality of work that shakespeare did because it's not possible to have incandescence when one is living in a cramped environment that doesn't inspire fiction so i'll come to this when we are uh, going on with our lecture so what's the dual argument about how the structure of society impact the uh, the women writers but before that there's another thing i would like to tell you see when a uh, wolf is writing her uh, essay she is drawing on her own personal experiences all her uh, whatever she has experienced in life up to then she is including that when she is talking to the audience and here when she is talking to them she is Uh, talking in the in the in the role of a narrator she is as if she is in the third person it is not wolf but she is very impassionately she is impersonally you know very objectively she is taking taking on the voice of a narrator and here she begins when she narrates also she starts by saying that um, it's her day at a college and she's she has got a fictional uh, university called oxbridge which is a combination of oxford and cambridge and then then she says that while she is trying to compose this lecture she suddenly uh, you know gets an important thought and then she runs across the lawn uh, across the college lawns of oxbridge and uh, she suddenly stopped by a guard who says that no you can't go into this lawn because this you can't Uh, go across this lawn because it is reserved for fellows and scholars that means the male students not for women so in this way you know she shut out of several areas in the same way and before she goes to a lunch party and she is inspired at the at the lunch party she is inspired by bright conversation of men and the women and at her own hostel where she is staying 
the food is very bland the conversation is very boring people only gossip there is no intelligent talk going on you know so she is reflecting on this day and as a narrator she realizes that women have been shut out of education and financial and intellectual legacy that men have always had access to that men have been enjoying all this but we have been as women we have been denied all this so she goes so this is like a story thing you know when she is talking to these uh, students then she says she goes to the library and uh, she wants to uh, you know look around for more information as to what was a kind of uh, uh, life that the women led before her times so she was looking into these books and she sees that all the books are written by men and she theorizes that women have been a mirror in which men have always seen themselves enlarged and strengthened so basically uh, you know men have been using women to sort of give themselves a uh, an importance they are not putting women on uh, you know any importance to women they they uh, subdue the women they uh, they put them down in such a way so that they look as if they are at a higher level so um uh, so the men have used their literature so men are able to write they are able to you know all the library books were all written by men so uh, they have used this library and uh, sorry the literature and their scholarship to affirm the inferiority of women so all the contents of these books also are always denigrating women and the men are trying to protect their own superiority so there was hardly any information on women's life in in the, in these uh, books in this library so here at this point what um, wolf does is she says you know she is creating another fictional uh, character that is shakespeare's sister we in reality obviously shakespeare did it didn't have this particular sister that she's talking about but she is creating a, a an imaginary picture of shakespeare's sister judith who is equally talented and who is who's got a potential for being a genius for becoming a genius but unfortunately she is not able to write a single word and at the end she ends up committing suicide because of the way the society is structured against women so this is one of the um uh, the um, in one of the chapters she talks about uh, about uh, shakespeare's fictional sister who uh, so she's saying you know shakespeare has been able to come up with a lot of uh, uh, impressive uh, work but had the sister been in that place during that time would she have been able to do that no she wouldn't have been because she was born a woman and she would not be even put up you know she wouldn't even been given an encouragement to study so this is the, she's trying to show that this is how women were being treated during those times and to see how much we have to suffer over the centuries women have been suffering all at the cost of all at the cost of men because the men haven't been allowing women to speak up to uh, speak for themselves so uh, what happens is to uh, you know all these uh, chapters and all these uh, things that she writes about in her essay she finally she conclude this lecture by you know telling these students these these uh, women you know these young women she tells them that you must uh, try and create a legacy for your daughters because she tries to encourage them and these are the women of newnham and girton colleges these are her audience you know this she had two lectures that she uh, she had conducted so she uh, you know tells them to she exhorts them to, she exhorts them to um, to create a legacy for their daughters to write more books write novels write anything you know just keep writing so that your daughters are not going to you know be subdued and subjugated to male uh, superiority so she believes that fiction is for the common good not just the individual good and that there is always something universal and powerful and good in it in fiction so she charges them to write voraciously 
so this is what i wanted to say about the content of the essay this basic content but we are focused we're going to focus only on chapter 4 but that also bits and pieces of it so um how did uh, this um, structure of society impact the women writers this is in chapter 4 she talks about this you know she uh, here also you should uh, be aware that wolf is in the role of a narrator okay it is not she is not wolf over here she is in the role of a narrator so the narrator has conceded that some upper class women have historically been able to pursue literary endeavors and considers individual cases of women who have done so so you know we or we think sometimes people will say okay it's all women are are they put on the same level like you know they haven't been able to they have not been exposed to all this it's not so there were some women who were of a higher class in society and they had uh, you know they were fortunate enough to learn how to write and they were they had a degree a level of education but even then they also had problems so here she gives the example of ann finch who was a childless uh, noble woman and so ann finch she was financially independent because remember Uh, Wolf is talking about you know you need to be financially independent and you need to have a room of your own if you need to succeed you know so here Anne Finch was fi- uh, financially independent but she couldn't arrive at incandescence you know that ability to write to come up with some superior work she couldn't do that while writing poetry because she had suffered so much during her previous years that. she she had, she was holding so much of bitterness in her that she was not allowing her mind to uh, be free you know that flow of thought she it was all being constrained it was not being allowed to come out it was not being able, they were not able to flower so uh, in that case what happens it contained so much of bitterness from the way she was barred from literary society and her poetry was also subjected to ridicule so whatever she wrote the men started ridiculing ridiculing her so they did not take her seriously why because she was a woman same was the case about margaret margaret cavendish she was the duchess of newcastle and she was also a childless noble woman she was also widely mocked for her attempts to write poetry and um, as a narrator she uh, will feels uh, sympathy for margaret and she says that had she been a man she would have been res- respected for her literary efforts so once again she says that uh, intellectual companionship is essential to achievement you know the reason why she says that is you know when you need to write you need to be in the company of people similar minded people who can give you a lot of inputs and give you you know the, the fodder for in for your creative pursuits so in this uh, canteen which they were the women's canteen they are just basically gossiping and nothing much is taking place it's all the usual household uh, talk that goes on whereas in the men's a uh, mess where they it was much better uh, uh, appointed and the food was also different for the boys side in the university men side and there the talk was all intelligent talk was going on a lot of debate and uh, discussions were going on which she was very interested at and if she was able to be in that kind of an atmosphere she would have done well that's what she says that intellectual companionship is essential to achievement so margaret cavendish was passionate and dedicated but because she was a woman she remained isolated and she did not have any potential so the narrator now compares margaret's uh, here uh, it's a very amusing uh, thing she comparison she is making uh, and then the narrator compares margaret's loneliness and thwarted ambitions to a giant cucumber choking to death a bed of roses and carnations so here the cucumber is a phallic symbol showing that the man is suffocating the flowers that is the women representing margaret's mind then she talks about uh, you can see here dorothy osborne also is there and you know dorothy was also another 
the lady who had a lot of talent but she left it uncultivated why because she was uh, aware of how the women were being treated before her and uh, therefore she did not even think of you know pursuing her literary her talent and her pursuit she, she didn't do that she just left it as it is oh and now on the other end of the spectrum here we're talking about women who are of the higher class now what about the women of the of the slightly lower class you know the middle class and the lower middle class background so she presents this lady afra ben she was the first woman writer to turn professional by making and making money by her writing so that was afra ben she was a 17th century writer and unlike the noble women Afra Ben was middle class, and she wrote money. After her death of her husband, she wrote uh, a, a lot in order to earn money. But uh, she had a moral side also. They say that it wasn't very good and things like that. But despite all that, she was able to uh, turn professional. So you can say that she is one of the uh, the first woman writer who became professional because she earned money by her writing. So now another question that comes is, why were women uh, uh, the women tended to write novels and not poetic drama? So uh, before this, we have uh, we have another person, uh, two writers whom uh, Wolf was uh, quite enamored with. You know, she was uh, quite uh, like they were like her. admire you know she she admired these two people they were jane austen and emily bront so uh, she spoke admiringly of jane austen and she compared the way in which austen as an author she disappears in her novels to the genius or she compared uh, austen to uh, shakespeare and but she doesn't speak very uh, approvingly of uh, charlotte Ron, because she, because despite her talent, she was not able to conceal her own bitterness. Because you know, they all these women, they have all gone through a lot of uh, bitterness uh, during the previous time you know, before they started writing. So all that bitterness has been taken out in the book. Everything that is written there. So that is what she says. You know, they are not objectively writing from another point of view. They are writing from. what is psychologically they are being affected and they are right they putting that into their on to paper so she says uh, that so eliot and austen uh, 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 wrote novels as it was convenient for them to write it in spurts you have uh, george eliot also in the picture so she is also one of the famous novelists and they found it why did they write novels because they found it very convenient to write in spurts because they had a lot of domestic obligations and interruptions so they found that okay i write a bit of piece then do something do my work then come back and write again so they wrote novels this way and that's why they were not so much into writing poetry in this way women were still bound to gender because they were not encouraged to write poetry if they had to write like shakespeare then their collective lives had to evolve all over they had to you know they had to change the lives of the women itself had to change overall if they had to uh, get on to writing poetry so and also another thing was the the relationships that the men, women had they were not able to go out and explore the world like and travel like men did their area of influence was restricted only to personal relationships so the gender dictated the genre that they could follow so women writers were also uh, afraid of what will other people think about they were even uh, uh, you know wondering about how their own family members would think about their writing so they were under constant pressure from ideology and another thing we should see is also the sentence construct of a woman writer was inherently different from that of a man from that of man and also another thing though society had progressed uh, patriarchal judgment on women still weighed very heavily society is proved the missing oh, everything is happening and uh, 
uh, things are going well for women but still the patriarchy that uh, specter of patriarchy was there he- being heavily behind them this is why because women did not have a, um, a legacy to fall back on they, there was nothing for them they did not have any large body of work you know famous works which they there and which they could say see we have done this and we have done that nothing of this was there to support them so uh, th- this was others if they did have a body of work they would have been able to unite uh, to get united and they would have been able to prove their skill to the men but the women unfortunately did not have a legacy to fall back on so you know when uh, wolf is uh, talking to these students about this she says that uh, you know she again says that we hope that the women now will start building a legacy for the future generation of their daughters this is what i've uh, told earlier also i was mentioning this to you so that they will help so that this legacy will help them to write in new forms you know they will take up writing not just novels it will be other uh, kinds of literature that they they would be able to pursue okay uh, you will see that jane austen's uh, novel uh, pride and prejudice is a good novel and here you know the narrator also believes that though austen wasn't proud to be writing uh, she had to hide her manuscripts see you know the way in which they had to all uh go about writing their novels can be it, it's easy for us to just read the novel that but when you look behind the story behind how they went about writing a novel it's really amazing and you know really heartbreaking because you know she was so afraid that she would you know that her family members would find this uh, manuscript and burn it or something like that so she would hide her manuscript when she heard anybody approaching but when you read the novel it looks like you know she did not uh, have anything written about that that difficulty that she was facing that is not reflected in the novel that is what is called incandescence you know because she was totally objective she was totally removed from her personal side and she was totally on to the writing side nothing to do with her personal work it did not come on to the paper whereas the other some of them they put their bitterness and their unhappiness and all is put in some form or the other in the novel so this is why uh, wolf says that austen has become incandescent like shakespeare and um, she says that you know they people will say that uh, the you know the women have fallen into the job of novel writing not through creative choice but because it is the only form that will fit their lives because that was the only way they could write something and that was the most convenient thing for them to do writing a novel so in that way you can't say that it was uh, writing a novel was not a sign of freedom it was a kind of constraint now if you look at it on the other point of view the other perspective if she comes out with a novel it does not mean that she's had the freedom because had she had the freedom she wouldn't be writing novel she would be writing something else she would be creating something else so because of a constraint she was forced to write novel so this was a kind of a constraint it was a sign of constraint and it was not a sign of freedom like other the men would have said see the women they are writing they are, we are giving them the freedom to write it was not that now if you look at it this way it was a sign of constraint so now uh, where we are talking about the criticism of uh, this particular essay wolf's chief antagonist um, was um, arnold bennett and he said that economic independence was not essential for a writer you know she said that i need a room of my own i need to be financially independent so uh, he says uh, you know there were many great male novelists who wrote under extreme poverty like dh lawrence so he says that, you know you don't have to say that you need to be economically independent to start writing something and uh, so base but if you look at it in another way wolf is actually saying that you need economic independence as a means to an end not the end to the means but a means to an end because 
for writing you need to have some form of economic independence and this is the only weapon with which we can fight patriarchy economic independence that is why she was in, insisting on this uh, she was also criticized for possessing class snobbery because she held a view that only a highly educated woman of her kind of culture could be interesting so she was uh, you know wolf was associated with this bloomsbury group and uh, she was so, you know she was criticized for being a snob because they said only highly educated women can could make uh, you know uh, writing interesting however this criticism is debunked because you can see that she was also favoring afrabin who was of a, a middle class lower middle class background and who was a pioneer in pre- pro- professionalism she was putting her up on a pedestal so this crit- criticism also you know can be debunked then her um, herbert muller was uh, of the opinion that her commitment to feminism was not radical but uh, trivial see what happens is her characters are gendered that is whatever is written in, in the no- in the novels that she writes in the in any of the stories that she writes she they say that her characters are gendered stereotypes like one of the heroines is a society hostess a wife a mother and these gendered stereotypes and they are not catering to uh, radical feminism wants so this is one of the criticism that they uh, had against her on her uh, essay then you know the educated women from within her constituency the people whom she thought is her group of people who who would be on her side they argued that wolf wanted privileges but without responsibilities and duties assigned to them because she says we need uh, that it seems it came across that you know that essay came across in that way that she wants privileges but without the responsibilities and duties assigned to them it shows how women writers have responded to uh, socio uh, economic cultural constraints by creating narratives that show f- disposition and constriction so here it shows that is this essay it shows how the women writers have responded to these constraints they write in their in their writings they show feelings of exclusion disposition and constrictions all this is shown uh, in their writings and that helps us to understand the socio economic cultural constraints that the women were facing so this is also being uh, you know this is another side of the critique she also did not lay much emphasis on professional competition which would have given her theory a personal maturity and social ref- relevance some said that she did not think women's right to vote was of any significance you know during this time the women were given the right to vote but they they told uh, virginia wolf uh, they were critiquing her saying that you know she she didn't think anything great of right to vote but you know virginia wolf was saying that even if the women had the right to vote if they are being subjugated and oppressed and not being given any economic independence will that right to vote really be helpful will it be of any significance to a woman if you just okay okay you vote but whom are you voting for the people who are standing in for uh, elections or anything are you able to make some change in that are you able to put up a woman on that you know and where your writing and literature is concerned you are not giving them any kind of leeway so does that help is so uh, this right to vote is just like a kind of a what you call it a rubber stamp is just something like on paper There's something like a lip service that you're giving but in reality it does not have any it doesn't hold much uh, you know water so wolf's theory is also another critic was that uh, they don't seem applicable to south asian cultures like india and here because in india you have a separate space for women is guaranteed by a parda or a private sitting room it's always been there but we have to ask ourselves has that enabled a woman to take up the pen has she been able to write she's got a private room for herself she's got some sort of privacy 
is it uh, enabling the women woman or is it enfeebling the woman you know that is the question that is coming here so it does not uh, her theories don't seem to be applicable to south asian cultures but let's look at the um, positive side where um, uh, her essay is concerned you know there were some women writers like finch and afra ben who were all in obscure you know nobody had heard about them but thanks to wolf their names have come up and um, she focused also on non literary kind of writing like diaries and letters not just novels so this also meant that more women writers could be read people there were more people who could read you know who would have had the uh, the privilege of reading and her focus was on the mental stress uh, borne by women and this helped theorists to understand the repression of women by certain societies so here there's an example that's given that's of the sandra gilbert's mad woman in the attic so you know what happens the advantage is that when you read something about uh, a novel about the 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 problems of women you know all the mental stress borne by women this is helping people to understand the society of those times you know what are the conditions what was the situation at that time and how you what what are the measures that you can take see it is not just uh, reading and saying okay this is good this is bad but what action you can take to remove these particular blocks that are there these obstacles that are there in society so you can bring the woman up to the level of man at least almost up to the level of man so the theorists also revised the literary history of victorian age by showing how women writers reacted under pressure from patriarchy so all these things they revised it the history of the victorian age and they showed because earlier nothing of this was exposed it was not written out people did not know but now it has slowly they have started revising the literary history showing how these women writers have reacted under pressure from patri- patriarchy how they have been able to come out of this particular uh, oppression so uh, before we end there is another thing that i would like to talk about you know we can look into uh, this essay room of one's own there are four themes that are running in this essay that is um, the first one is like we all know it is this financial and intellectual freedom okay so that is one of the themes that are going on in this room of one zone then the second one is a uh, second theme that is moving going on is on woman and society it is what a woman is undergoing and the kind of society that she is living in and then the third one is about uh, creating a legacy for the women writers which she is stressing on at every point every time she is giving this talk uh, at every uh, instance she is creating this she says that you have to create a legacy for women writers and then she also talks about the truth she says um, experience and perspective to reveal the truth and not using facts and figures so what she does is when she is uh, giving this talk she doesn't talk about facts and figures you know like statistical uh, data you know so many percentage of people have done this so many percentage she, she doesn't want that she is talking through experience and perspective to give the truth the actual situation of women at that point of time during her time so she is giving these experiences so that she is able to open the eyes of the women the young women in front of her so that they are not going to fall into the same thing of under this patriarchal cloak of patriarchy and they are able to come out of it and do something for themselves in their lives okay so with that we come to the end of virginia wolf i hope you have been uh, able to grasp whatever i have been trying to put forth if there is anything you want to or else i'll carry on with the next session if uh, if this is clear shall i carry on